to go to the text and I want to read it in your hearing. You remember it. It is uh, us moving on from where, uh, as a, I suppose, a springboard where we've been in terms of service and work in Christ, washing the disciples' feet. So we're there in John 13. What a privilege to finally hear Jesus now speaking to believers. And the text says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put, you remember that, had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, verse 4, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel that was wrapped around him. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, yet the word of our Lord shall stand forever. God, open our hearts and our minds. Let us receive what it is you are saying to the church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I mentioned before, it is my desire to teach in this moment, particularly uh, in a didactic fashion. I want to go over some doctrine today, having already set the foundation for this text. I really want us to dig in and go just a bit deeper because uh, the application process of knowing the Word of God becomes the most important after you have heard the Word of God. And so you, you get comfortable. Just, just, just listen as I teach you the Word of God. And, and my prayer is that God would press it deeply on your heart. You remember coming to the text and we said that Jesus' life was marked by service. It was marked by work. And I want to say that in particular in Christendom, one of the problems with serving people, and one of the problems with working is that by and large, when you hear that in the context of Christianity, you get this idea that you're supposed to be a doormat. That is to say, I serve in the church and I allow people to walk over me. I go home and I allow my children or my husband or my wife to just walk over me. I go to work and I serve and I just let people do whatever it is they want to. Brothers and sisters, that's not the case. That is not a scriptural understanding and reference for service in the Bible. The way, or the reason rather, that God, through Jesus Christ, Christ is able to serve, it was because of what he knew. There are some things you must know in order to properly perform the task of service. You remember, as we talked about before, that Jesus knew where he came from. That's verse 3, he had come from God. He knew where he was going. That's him going back to God in verse 3. He knew what he was here to do. That's verse 1. And he knew how to treat others. Again, verse 1, having loved his disciples who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The reason why Jesus is able to disrobe, take off his church clothes, if you will, wrap around him a towel and wash the disciples' feet is because he knew where he came from. That's his origin. He knew where he was going. That's his destiny. He knew why he was here. He was here to die for the world. 
That's his purpose. And he knew how to treat people. That's his morality. And brothers and sisters, I want to say to you that Jesus, again, I can't say it enough, it answers those uh, fundamental questions of philosophy. If you were to go that direction, I don't mean to go that way today, but we know, and I, I, again, as I mentioned before, and I can't see you, but as I mentioned before, I tell my kids all the time, you are the smartest person in the room when you walk in. And the reason is because you know this. You know where you came from, you know where you're going, you know why you're here, and you know how to treat people. This is according to scripture. That's why Jesus is able to bow down and wash the disciples' feet. And I suggested to you on last time that this is why you can serve. You can serve because you know where you came from. You know where you're going. You know why you are here and you know how to treat people. It doesn't matter how they treat you. It doesn't matter how they look down on you. What they do is inconsequential. I mean, sure, you keep yourself in a position where you're not going to get hurt and people are not going to do those types of things to you. But ultimately, it doesn't matter if you have an attitude. It doesn't matter if you say, hey, you are supposed to wash my feet. It doesn't matter if they say to you, hey, I got this callus over here. I need you to rub that extra. I got some, I've been on my feet all day. I need you to massage that. It doesn't matter what they do, what they talk about in service. You know who you are. But that's the deal. And that's how we serve. And brothers and sisters, we say that as a result of that, Jesus was able to rise from supper. This is what he did. It's right there in the text. He laid aside. He lays aside his garments. He takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, pours water into a basin, and washes the disciples' feet. And again, as I mentioned before, as we go through this text, uh, homiletically and arranging the text, uh, the verbs here are all in the present tense, which means that it says that Jesus lays aside, he rises. And so that action in that moment, which suggests to us that you and I ought to be presently in the process of serving. And the reason why you and I can serve is because we know where we came from, where we're going, why we're here, and how to treat people. Brothers and sisters, I mean to say to you in no uncertain terms today, I don't know what you think about it, but you need to understand that everybody in this house is a slave. And if you thought differently, then you have it twisted. When we come to Jesus Christ, we come as his slave. Now, um, when you talk about service and serving, um, you have to understand that as a slave, as a servant, you actually have no say. Uh, those of us who've had the opportunity to serve in the military, we understand that Uncle Sam owned us. Uncle Sam told us where to go, how long to stay there, how much to eat, where to sleep, dictated everything, how long to sleep. We belong, before we could leave and go anywhere outside a 50, 100 mile radius, we had to ask Uncle Sam if it's okay for us to go. And you could actually get in trouble for harming yourself. You, you're out doing something silly, uh, riding a motorcycle too fast, jumping off a building, swimming or something, and, and you injure yourself. You have injured Uncle Sam's property. <laughs> and I mean to say to you, brothers and sisters, that you have been drafted into God's army. You no longer belong to yourself. You have been bought with a price. We belong to God. I say to you that everybody in here is a slave. And if you thought differently, you've got it twisted. 
I want to go didactically through um, the Old and New Testament to paint this picture for you because when we come to the text, there is, there is no doubt that Jesus served. He washed the disciples' feet, but uh, in particular, the word serve, service, work, uh, these terms do not appear in the text, but I don't think I'd get any argument from people in here to say that Jesus served the disciples. Um, he comes to this place of service because this is not just a textual idea. It's not just something that happens in the context of that particular event, but it's all through scripture. Um, the word for serve, service, or servant, uh, is translated uh, in that way some 1,100 times in the Old and New Testament. And parenthetically, my brothers and sisters, let me say this, uh, there were several times uh, in um, the Old and New Testament where the word slave is supposed to be translated and they translated it to servant because of the time. Uh, particularly related to slave trade that did not want to offend anybody. So in the translation, they put servant there and uh, quite frankly, messed a lot of us up. And, and, and again, here we are again today and we hear all of the racial tensions that's going on and nobody wants to talk about being a slave, but you need to understand that if you are saved, you've been bought with a price, you are a slave of Jesus Christ. And listen, one of the pictures, one of the motifs of redemption is the marketplace. Uh, as I'll get to momentarily, Jesus says he came to give his life as a ransom uh, for many. Quite frankly, brothers and sisters, you and I were on the, uh, the marketplace at the, the block there standing up and we were being sold into slavery and God comes in through Jesus Christ and buys us back. He redeems us. He pays the price. And I'm telling you that we owe our lives to Jesus Christ and like it or not, whether uh, they translated it properly or improperly or whether you like the term or not, you are a slave. Now, I'm not a slave to a white man or to some other person, but I am a slave to Jesus Christ. And I don't want to hear any of my brothers uh, who uh, consider themselves black Hebrews, and I love it, God bless you, but I don't uh, ascribe to the fact that we have to move away from Christianity, uh, our Islamic brothers uh, moving away from Christianity because Jesus is a white man. Good gracious, I want to drop my glasses. He's not even white. I mean, good gracious, he's a Jew. Let's start right there. Uh, but but uh, let's start with that and simply say that uh, I am not submitting myself in particular uh, to that particular ethnicity. I'm submitting myself to Jesus Christ who was born in the flesh. And so I, I simply say that, brothers and sisters, I need for us to get a hold to that today, that we are slaves. And so when we come to this idea of slave or servant in the Old Testament, it had to do with action and obedience. You can't have a slave who does nothing. Good gracious, I wish I had time to stop there, but I got to move on. Uh, there are a lot of people who would claim that they are saved, uh, that they know Jesus Christ, but they do nothing. You can't have a slave who does nothing because if you don't do anything, you automatically are disobedient. Therefore, you're not a slave. And so we come to this place where there's action and obedience. Now, there are guys all through the Old Testament who were called servants. We go with Abraham, Jacob, Joshua, you got Ruth, you got Hannah, you got Samuel, Jesse, uh, all of these people who were called servants, who were called slaves of, of God. And Moses was called slave or servant 40 times and David some 50 times called a slave. And then, of course, we come to the book of Isaiah, where we understand that Jesus begins to be the culmination 
the epitome of the slave as we hear in Isaiah 52, 13, 15, and then Isaiah 53 where Jesus uh, is that suffering servant. So that Jesus identifies even in the Old Testament with this motif of servants. When we come to the New Testament, there uh, are two words in particular, um, dulios and um, uh, diakonos, and you don't have to worry about that. I don't care about it anyway, but I want to tell you what they mean. Uh, essentially, when the New Testament talks about service, uh, talks about servants or slaves, it has to do with this context of master servant. This idea that I am a slave and I belong to somebody. The other idea is waiting on tables. That is, I am working, I am doing something. And I want to say to you brothers and sisters that you can't divorce Savior with Lord. Uh, God is our Lord. When you come to the first book of the Bible, uh, what you hear, and uh, look, I know that uh, some of you don't enjoy the kind of teaching. Why don't you just nudge your neighbor there, wake him up. Uh, some of y'all don't want to sleep on me here, and I want to wake y'all up. And don't edit this out, the, the tapes, because some of them probably sleep as well. Uh, but I want you to hear me when I say that uh, this idea of lordship salvation, listen now, uh, people want to say, hey, look, he is my savior, but I can do whatever I want to do. That does not work. It does not jive with scripture. If he is your savior, he is also your Lord. Uh, early in the book of Genesis, what we have is the Lord identifying himself. His self-identification is this, Lord God. That's who I am. I'm Lord God. And when Satan shows up, talks to Eve as a serpent, he says, didn't God say? God identifies himself as Lord God. Satan said, didn't God say? Lord has to do with the relationship. God has to do with the religion. Um, Satan said, let's drop the relationship and let's keep the religion. And so from then on, you hear even Eve start to refer to her, God as God, not Lord God. Brothers and sisters, I mean to say to you, and probably for emphasis, I take off my glasses, but I can't see you. But listen, I want you to understand, he is not just Savior, he is Lord. That means he is in complete charge of your life. He rules and super rules. Listen now, you can't just do what you want to do. God is in charge. If you are truly saved, you got to ask God's permission before you move. Don't just move and say, God bless it. Now, listen, now, some of you are going to hear this. You're going to be convicted to the core. And then you're going to say, well, I'm already in it now. God, can you just sort of fix it? No. Go back. Get that thing right. Say, listen, now, God, if you want this to be over with, I'll make it over with. I'll give it up because you have no right to your life. You are a slave. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so this idea, brothers and sisters, uh, of slave uh, is not something to look, be looked down upon. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus took, again, here we are, just as he takes the towel, and we'll deal with that. We won't be able to get to it today. But he took upon himself the form of a servant. Here he is saying that I am a slave. I took upon myself. And then, brothers and sisters, we come to Romans chapter 6. Uh, we move, those of us who are believers, Romans chapter 6, verses 17 through 18. We move from being slaves to sin to being slaves to righteousness. Just like you had urges, passions, when you were a sinner. You're supposed to have those same urges and passions.
actions as a righteous person. Uh, uh, that, that, that every time you saw the commercial come on, it just moved you. Uh, and, and, and every time you hear your song comes on, come on, it just moves you. That's the way you ought to be in the service of Jesus Christ. You ought to be moved by who Christ is. you to understand that if you thought you were something else other than a slave, you got it twisted. <laughs>